palace, large crowds of spectators are on hand for an historic occasion. It is the first peacetime investiture in which Canadians take part since the war's end. While friends and well-wishers look on, the mid-morning taxis carry the distinguished passengers through the main gates of the palace for their important appointment with His Majesty. Altogether, 21 Canadian officers assemble to be invested with decorations ranging from Commander of the Bath and Distinguished Service Order to the Military Cross. Awarded the CB, CBE and the DSO is Major General C. Vokes. Lieutenant Colonel Rankin receives the DSO. Autograph hunters get a willing hand from Lieutenant Colonel Stockdale, DSO, while three Indian VC winners look on. The conclusion of the peacetime investiture marks another chapter in the history of Canadian fighting men. Montreal is the gathering place for the first council meeting of the Provisional Civil Aviation Organization. The meeting deals with the Five Freedoms Agreement for cooperation in international air travel. Before the official opening, a keynote is set by the Australian delegate, Mr. Arthur McComb. The formation of the Provisional International Civil Aviation Organization, which is now meeting in Montreal, had its origin at a conference held in Chicago in November last. I have been chosen as the Australian representative on this council and uh, recently flew to Montreal to take up my work here. Cosmopolitan Montreal has given us a great welcome and I look forward to my stay in Canada. Uh, the kindness of whose people was so much appreciated by our own Air Force trainees. To date, 20 nations have members sitting on the interim council, a temporary body pending the establishment of a more permanent organization. Discussing privileges to be extended to signatory nations, the delegates cover a wide field. Technical matters are probed with a view to standardizing communication systems, licensing, safety regulations, charts and weather reporting. Canada's views are presented by Mr. A. McKim. The formation of this international body on civil aviation is a hopeful sign for the future. Canada's policy is one of international cooperation. She believes that an efficient airline should find it easier to comply with the regulations laid down by a single international body than to deal with a great many separate nations to overcome the barriers to air transport. This council, we hope and intend, will make a contribution to world security and world progress. The gathering of the nations to develop some means of cooperation in air travel carries on in an atmosphere of optimism and reflects the importance of future global transportation. To the present setup of the Canadian Forces Radio Service, soon will be added new and more powerful transmitters to extend the present range of programs. Located in the Aldershot area, the radio system, manned entirely by service personnel, is doing a worthwhile job in the task of making the stay of repats in the UK more interesting. From studios in London, CFRS sends out musical shows to the boys in CRU. Denny Vaughan and Ain't Misbehavin'. Combining to service CFRS is the CBC, the BBC, and the American Forces Network, while several shows originate with the broadcasting detachment of the Army show. Canadian Caravan, starring Jerry Wilmot, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation representative, is sent out regularly over CFRS and the BBC Light program. Canadian Caravan! In London, the BBC presents the happy-go-lucky feature, Canadian Caravan. Here's distinctive new music starring the all-soldier Canadian Army Spring and Swing Group, directed by Captain Bob Fong. And once again, that man... Somebody calling me? That's it, Jerry Wilmot! <laughs> Captain Bob Fong has gained very much the man of the moment as he presents the Canadian Army Men with Strings in a distinctive impression of one of the tunes from Manhattan's famous Bowery. 
here in brand new holiday mood is Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Between 7 in the morning and 11 at night, CFRS fills the ether with top line programs. A favorite among the repats is Information Joe. He gathers pertinent questions from the boys at the repat depots and then solves their problems with official answers over CFRS. Repat Johnny Canuck's idle time is taken care of through the blending of educational and entertainment programs on the highest scale by the Canadian Forces Radio Service. <laughs> Danny Webb, the ebony flash from Canada, tunes up for his forthcoming bout with the Welsh champion, Sid Worgan. Rated sixth in the world at his weight, Danny hopes to knock off the British Empire title before catching the ship back to Shangri-La. Undoubtedly the best boxing exponent the Canadian Army has produced in this war, Danny Webb is a serious fighter and concentrates on his training like the erstwhile champion he hopes to be someday. Danny Webb, the powerful little fighter who has blasted his way through all opposition, looks forward eagerly to the day when he may be wearing the crown of world champion. From the northern timber areas of Canada comes pulp wood to be made with the aid of science into fabrics. Using special equipment, the logs are chopped and mixed with chemicals to produce cellulose sheets. From this stage, they are further processed to eventually become lovely rayon material for my lady's wardrobe. The dress industry in Canada supplies thousands of garments per week through the application of this process. To one raw goes many of the garments for relief distribution in devastated areas. The whirling machines gather together the varied talents of their operators toward the ultimate production of flawless materials. Pattern design being of prime importance to catch the eye of Miss Canada, there's a great variety created. Even the most fastidious designers in Paris would find little of which to complain in this regard. Methods by which mass production can be reached without harm to the quality of output have been studied successfully, again to the advantage of the women of Canada. All dresses are individually designed before going to the cutting rooms for assembly line methods. They are then fashioned by stylish models. No longer does Miss Canada cast envious eyes on Paris and New York creations. Right in her own backyard is the pulp log, which now produces undreamed of beautiful textiles for the fashions of tomorrow. In the Canadian Army zone of occupation in Germany, the fishing industry gets a go-ahead signal. Plans are laid by naval officials for the resumption of work of the Jerry fishing fleet, which was chased into hiding by our Navy and Air Force. The fishermen salvage what they can from the long, unused tackle. With food shortages looming, the importance in the revival of the fishing industry has not escaped the notice of the military government. Every effort is bent in getting the ships out to sea. A patrol boat, manned entirely by German naval personnel and carrying a German M.O., accompanies the fleet to take care of accidents and distress. The actions of this boat are answerable to all cases to a responsible Allied official. The catch for the day is hauled aboard. It represents a good many meals to be distributed among the waiting populace on the mainland. The 
disruption of rail and road services throughout the area makes distribution difficult. In most cases, the catch is disposed of locally. Thus, in some measure, the terror of disease stemming from the lack of food is forestalled through the combined efforts of allied military government officials and German fishermen. 